Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Ooh, yeah. Stacy? If you're wanting to talk about the Confederacy all around us, you know, we're in North Carolina and there's they're in the headline because of all this anti-Confederacy stuff going on. It turns out there's this was a quite an important state to the Confederacy. And you do see this. You do learn this when you move here. I didn't really realize how important it was to the Confederacy until I moved here and you drive around and there's just signs of it everywhere. But first, I want to talk about global these trade deals all being renegotiated and trade wars being started because we are Marcus Finance Scandal, we are the Kaiser Report. I want to talk about that while the rest of the world is mired in the chaos that is Trump. Um, the headline here reads, Trump signs measure on Chinese trade practices, says it's just the beginning. President Donald Trump last week signed a memorandum that would lead to a trade investigation of alleged Chinese theft of intellectual property. The measure directs U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer to look into options to protect U.S. intellectual property. It does not take any specific action against China at this point. He said, we will safeguard the copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and other intellectual property that is so vital to our security and to our prosperity. This is just the beginning. He's wrong! That's not the way to approach this. America should take the lead and roll back copyright and patent law protection, intellectual property laws, back to zero. And let the intellectual property free. And then allow Americans to have access to their birthright, the ideas that they created. Don't lock them up on corporate balance sheets. Artists in the music industry don't need more than five years of protection. Thomas Jefferson put 14 years in the Constitutional. Uh, Constitution, Article 17, which covers copyright. Let ideas free. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't really matter because Bitcoin and blockchain is going to put both China and America out of business, thank God. It'll euthanize these two knuckleheads. And it won't be an issue in five years from now. But if America wants a chance to survive in the 21st century, get rid of copyright law, get rid of the patent protection law, get rid of these trolls, and just let people make a living for once. Well, of course, the term Yankee comes from, I guess, the Dutch would call us the Yankees because we stole all their ideas and copyrights and patents. But uh, as a new land, well, we were an old land, but we obviously genocided the original inhabitants here. Um, that's going to be covered in our next episode as we look at this confederacy and the self-reflection and going back to what America is all about. But... Uh, yeah, obviously, we started out as a copyright, you know, terrorist. <laughs> we stole everybody's copyrights and ideas and flourished for it. And obviously, China's doing the same. Exactly. This is the way nations have typically grown is through theft. And China steals a lot of all of America's intellectual property. And But the way to fight it is not to become a, a wall-building kind of, um, you know, troll living under a bridge and hoping the bad people go away. Be bold. Get rid of copyright law. Get rid of patent law. Take my own patents. Make them free to everyone to use. That would kill Wall Street immediately. I'm all for it, but I don't have that option right now. You know, in terms of making everything free and put it in an open source and online and just overturning the system, I, uh, I'm going off topic here, but I, I saw a piece about uh, money laundering, global money laundering, and I think it's several trillion dollars as a huge industry. And 98% of it happens through the centralized command and control banking system through the huge banks. Most of it, trillions and trillions of dollars goes through that system. And the, the, the article is pointing out that actually, in fact, open source, decentralized, sovereign currencies like Bitcoin is actually less of that and it's more, um, it's easier to stop when the entire network is looking for it. Right, you know, one of the uh, problems that those who hate Bitcoin have put forward as a, an attack vector is through the layer of ISP, the way ISPs control global digital activity and that an ISP would start charging the Bitcoin network for access or they would shut it down. So what did Blockstream do? You know, Bitcoin Ooh. heavyweight Blockstream. What did they do? They're like, we're going to go uh, to the outer space. We're going to satellites. 
we're going to, which of course the cost of putting a satellite into orbit is dropping down towards zero. I mean, it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper down that asymptotic curve towards zero. The same thing that happened to microchips and bandwidth and memory. Same thing with satellite launching. So you can put up 66 satellites, uh, which is a good number for an array of satellites. It gives you global coverage of satellites. And you can take your Bitcoin protocol up into the satellite layer and bypass all these ISPs. And you got hundreds of billions of dollars to do it. You know, the Bitcoin is going to be worth a trillion dollars in the not too distant future. So all the power is flowing to the decentralized Bitcoin network and away from the centralized Politburo that it, what were we talking about? <laughs> uh, well, you know, of course you can't have satellites. What without, was the topic? Uh, I was talking about money laundering, but let's move on. Oh, the on banks, to the, yeah, the central, okay, they know, yeah. the cent central banks. Yeah, so let's move on. You mentioned Bitcoin and the blockchain and, and, and the satellites. Of course, you cannot have satellites. You cannot have smartphones, smart tablets, any of this stuff without rare earth metals and all this sort of stuff. So as the world... <laughs> misses so many stories because of the traditional media being stuck into 24 hours. You only have 24 hours and really to cover the news on say CNN, but actually it's only like 17 hours if you take out all the commercials. So a lot of stuff is happening outside of Trump's tweets. Um, we know about the conflict in Syria. We don't know about the conflict in Yemen. There is still an ongoing conflict and war in Afghanistan and Iraq. We hear about this madman in North Korea. Well, here's a story I found via Twitter, and it actually was published on July 3rd, so the day before Independence Day here in America. Independence, obviously, for those who stole the lands, because we have to keep on referring to that now, because this is truly where America started as we stole the lands. So July 4th, Independence Day, but this story came out July 3rd. So as we uh, gear up for conflict with North Korea, that's one of the possible wars. There's also Venezuela and Iran and other countries still on the horizon to bomb. North Korea is sitting on $6 trillion in mineral resources. Uh, we saw a, a headline similar to that about Afghanistan that they have trillions of dollars worth of things like lithium. And uh, this is one of the reasons perhaps we conjecture, the conjecture was that perhaps this is part of why Afghanistan is so crucial. But North Korea is sitting on $6 trillion in mineral resources. It has long been regarded as a poor country. But as it turns out, North Korea is a lot richer than we thought, or at the very least has the potential to be. North Korea has mineral resources estimated to be worth $6 trillion, according to courts, and the secretive state is sitting on a vast array of mineral resources. Oh, yeah. Not, well, not to gild the lily too much, but North Korea is also apparently on the state level getting into Bitcoin mining. So now you have China, Russia, and North Korea. You have Australia adding Bitcoin to their strategic reserves to the national bank. But uh, yeah, North Korea has a lot of natural resources and minerals yet to be exploited. And well, you know, what does that mean? So does Africa. Africa's got a lot of natural resources too. I mean, but it, uh, it attracts colonizing forces. It attracts outsiders who... Well, in fact, the court's original court's article says, uh, North Korea is sitting on trillions of dollars of untapped wealth and its neighbors want in. China is the sector's main customer. Last September, South Korea's state-run Korea Development Institute said that the mineral trade between North Korea and China remains a cash cow for Pyongyang despite UN sanctions and that it accounted for 54% of North Korea's total trade volume to China in the first half of 2016. In 2015, China imported $73 million in iron ore from North Korea and $680,000 worth of zinc in the first quarter of this year. So they also mentioned that North Korea has been particularly active in coal mining. Obviously, a lot of that coal is going to China. China is now cutting back on coal mining. Anyway, coal-powered uh, gas and uh, uh, coal-powered electric plants. So uh, they don't need that as much, which is why they also are applying sanctions to that. Well, you know, countries start off as exporting commodities to their vassal overlords, like the U.S. did to England, you know, exporting things like tar uh, from right here in North Carolina, you know, the Tar Heel State, uh, which went into shipbuilding in England. And then America wanted to go further up the um, chain of creating products away from just commodity provider to finished products. And then they put 
the UK and England out of business because we became home of the iPad and stuff. And then China was exporting that and factoring slave laborers in North Korea. And it takes leadership though to break out of that export mentality and move up the uh, chain of processing goods. So um, you have to also fend off invading uh, commercial interests from outside. So North Korea has been making a lot of money by exporting stuff, but they don't have the leadership to take the economy higher up the food chain. And um, maybe they never will. Well, uh, yeah, but we're talking about global geopolitics. North Korea doesn't matter. Any small country does not matter. All that matters are the big powers. And the big powers right now is a U.S. fading empire. Is China rising? What is China going to do? In terms of the U.S. is, uh, you know, over the past few years, they're pulling out their basically financial nuclear weapons. They're cutting people off from SWIFT. As Jim Rickards has said on this show, once you do that, you know, it's hard to go back from there. And will other nations develop their own SWIFT alternatives? Um, here we have the case, just like in a, um, what you're seeing, you mentioned that they're mining Bitcoin, and here is a little indicator of why they might be mining Bitcoin in North Korea, because the UN applied sanctions from March of 2016, which banned the export of gold, viridium, uh, titanium, and rare earth metals. Earlier this year, a group of UN experts concluded that North Korea, despite sanctions, continues to export banned minerals. They determined as well that North Korea uses another mineral, gold, along with cash, to entirely circumvent the formal financial sector. So of course, <laughs> gold has always been a way to get around sanctions. Um, here it's being used to get around sanctions because it's fungible. You can use it. It's not barcoded. Nobody knows if it's melted down anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, for the most part, although it does have to carry a serial number to be considered bona fide good delivery gold, they all have serial numbers. Those bars have They're selling numbers. it for a discount. Okay, well, discounted gold or tungsten wrapped in gold. This is the raw. This is the raw gold from the gold mines. Yeah, in gold North is not as fungible as people say it is. For good delivery in the global market, it needs a serial number. That needs a blockchain essentially. So, <clears throat> but it is, uh, it is easy to melt down and sell for a discount. And the weight is certainly there to be weighed to see whether it's good. But North Korea uh, is uh, amazingly back in the news. And, um, of course, we're going to find out from our guests coming up after the break, Dan Collins of the China Money Report, all kinds of stuff that's happening in China, North Korea, Bhutan, India. That's right. Get out your yoga mats. Get out your Himalayan pink $5 a gram whole food salt. We're going to the Himalayas. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the Doklam Transgression? Yeah, I saw that film in the 1974. It was directed by Alan Pakula, starred Warren <laughs> Beatty and Dustin Hoffman. Well, I think you'll find out from Dan Collins in the second half. Oh, yeah, Dan will know. Don't go away. Stay right there. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to Shanghai and talk with Dan Collins of the ChinaMoneyReport.com. Dan, welcome back. Hey, Max. How's it going? Uh, pretty good. So here in America, people are throwing sticks and stones and calling each other bad names. But other places of the world are actually having some geopolitical tension that could result in actual geopolitical chaos. Let's talk about what's happening in India and China and what is the... Dolcum transgression. It sounds like a 1974 political thriller starring Warren Beatty and Gene Hackman, but I don't think that's what it is. What what what, what is it? Well, we have, we have a major escalating situation here in Asia, which has received hardly any coverage. It's really surprising. Uh, the Dolcum Plateau is basically an area between uh, China and Bhutan, uh, with India acting as Bhutan's protectorate. These two have gone to war before over this area been very quiet since I've lived in China now for 20 years. We've really heard, not heard anything about it. But now we have literally the sec world's second largest country has invaded the lar world's largest country. India has mechanized units and troops now in areas China considers its territory. It's been going on for two months. The China has said the clock is ticking. And I'm going to predict on your show, Max, we're going to have a shooting war before the end of next month, September, if India does not withdraw. So 
little bit the, the, the detail. So basically the Himalayas separating India and China, there's one area India likes to call the chicken neck, which is kind of a path through the Himalayas. They do not like China anywhere near that area, and that's why they've moved troops in there two months ago. This goes all the way back 1841. These two were fighting over this. this the Brit, uh, Indian Sikh army invaded Tibet. China repelled them. Uh, and at, the British then, when they colonized India, did a deal with China that said that's Chinese territory. China's using that today as their footing for international law. They had a war in 1962. Uh, 1,500 Indian troops died. 1,800 uh, 800 Chinese troops died. China won that as well. You know, the, the interesting thing what we're going to see here, and I hope uh, India understands, is China in 1962 and 2017 is a completely different thing. Uh, 1962, they kept it to land. There was no Air Force, no navies involved. But the war of words here we have now going in Asia is getting worse and worse by the day. India is saying we'll use our navy to blockade your oil supplies. And, and China's saying, uh, don't, you know, you've messed with us, we're going to give you a black eye. The words are getting worse and worse by the day. They had uh, some hand-to-hand -hand combat go on yesterday where they didn't start shooting, but they were throwing ro rocks at each other. But this is getting worse and worse. The situation is uh, spinning out of control unless we get an Indian troop withdrawal. Now, did I hear you correctly? You said something about mechanized mechanized soldiers or mechanized warfare is that that i hear uh, the, what is that well they have military vehicles military units um you know which they kind of call passenger or uh, troop carriers from india but the india has put troops into chinese territory and that's the key thing china will not negotiate until those troops pull back and that's where we are now it's been two months and things will get pretty hairy here right and you talk about bhutan in that country of course famous for their gross happiness product to GHP competing with GDP, right? So this is a happy little nation drawn into a pretty severe conflict, yes? Yeah, I think uh, they're, they're basically being, uh, you know, they're a, kind of a puppet state of India in many ways. So they really don't have a say at this point. This is really between the two big, you know, global powers. Right, so uh, some of the language here. So the press in India re reports that Chinese soldiers have tried to cross the quote, line of actual control into India, and some fistfights in Iraq throwing broke out. So I guess there's a red line that they that crossed over. Now, there's been almost no mention of this in the Western media. Uh, how's it being covered in China, Dan? Um, China has been, uh, you know, you've, you can read about it in all the Chinese press. It's very serious. You know, nationalism itself has been growing in China for decades. China's looked the other way on lots of very tiny, small incidents uh, the, over the last years. And if you gauge the, 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 the zeitgeist of the population here, China wants, the Chinese population wants to do something about this. That's, that's the most troubling thing. They, don't, um, they would totally support a, a, a conflict between China and India. I'm surprised outlets like CNN are not covering it because they're usually cheerleaders for any war America wants to get into. And clearly America could jump in here and drop a lot of bombs and you know, do the American thing. Why would the, why would American media not be covering this? This is blood to the hounds. They love war. Why are they ignoring this, Dan? Well, I think they're, uh, you know, we, they're, they're uh, over, <laughs> probably overburdened with the workflow in the United States covering a couple hundred idiots attacking each other in parks. Uh, you know, why pay attention to these kind of global, in, this India-China conflict's not the only thing they're missing. I mean, we basically, as the United States, geopolitically, we, we have lost Southeast Asia. As we've talked about on your show before, the Philippines is now becoming an economic satellite of China. Uh, Malaysia, China's investing in three ports there, rail. Basically, all of these countries in Southeast Asia, which had a ocean conflicts with China, are now fully on board. Even the president of Philippines, Duarte, got in front of China. The Chinese legislative body and said, America, I'm with you. I mean, we are literally have lost Southeast Asia geopolitically, and we're asleep at the wheel. This conflict and many others. Right. And, of course, you have the Silk Road uh, being built in the region, this huge uh, infrastructure project. Uh, and um, how much of this brewing conflict between China and India is actually about the Silk Road that China is building uh, and, and the rise well, of... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, China. I mean, China has put in $160 billion in the Asian in Infrastructure Bank, these Central Asian countries, Russia's lost the influence. China's now the arbiter of, arbiter of power in Central Asia. 
You go to Kazakhstan, you go to Tajikistan, all of these countries are now dependent on Chinese economic power. They're coming and they're building rail, they're building power plants, roads, bridges. This is all about expanding China into Europe. So they're, basically the one belt, one road ends in a lot of Eastern European countries. They're, China's building high speed rail between Serbia and Romania. So not only is Washington DC asleep at the wheel, but so is Berlin. When East Europe now wants infrastructure investment, they go to Beijing, they don't go to Berlin. So this is gonna be able to one belt, one road, it serves a few purposes. Number one, it gets, it stops any foreign country, i.e. United States blocking Chinese oil imports down in the Straits of Malacca near Singapore. They've got another transportation route over land and there is high speed rail now from China to Europe going in two weeks. Uh, where the sea route six weeks. So China's gonna be able to power, the, the second purpose is that it, has, it takes up a lot of excess capacity in the steel industry and these other types of infrastructure type uh, companies that need the uh, export markets. So um, China's done an amazing job geopolitically in Southeast Asia and now in Central Asia. And these are the types of things we used to do in America. We used to come in and build the bridges, the roads, give the loans for that and develop the countries. That was, uh, you know, exporting your power, but now, you know, the world's firmly moving into Chinese orbit. All right. So, uh, Dan Collins, you know, we've talked to you for many years now, and um, your analysis of the region has been great and very measured and um, circumspect. But I hear a tone in your voice that seems like you're hitting a bit of the panic button here, that there's actually uh, things are heating up to the point where you can't just paper it over with rhetoric. And, um, you know, China is an interesting player in that they bought over 40 billion of U.S. Treasury securities in June. Japan sold 20 billion, uh, meaning that China is once again the number one holder of U.S. debt. That's 1.5 trillion worth of U.S. debt. Isn't this a sort of Democles held over America? Can't China dump these at any moment, especially if they've got this incredible uh, diversity globally, economically, they don't need necessarily to sell stuff in American Walmart outlets as much anymore. Dan, your thoughts? No, it's a, that's true. So like we, was, we were talking the One Belt, One Road project, it mentioned specifically con connecting China to Asia, Africa, and Europe. There's no mention of North America. So this is all about uh, growing their economy outside the United States. The United States is only about 15 to 20% now of their exports. Um, you know, China is becoming less and less dependent on the United States, more dependent on their domestic market and also other global export markets. Um, in terms of panicking about the India-China situation, I mean, yeah, these are the types of situations that can, you know, with, uh, that can quickly, easily grow out of control. So, but uh, from a military standpoint, I would expect China is going to handle India pretty easily. We just hope that it doesn't escalate beyond that. Is the rise in some of these uh, basic industrial commodities like copper, et cetera, is this being driven by kind of a renewed inflation in China? You know, the last time we spoke, there was this idea that Chinese economy was shrinking, GDP was collapsing, was understated, and that the downward move in commodities would uh, continue to reflect a uh, deflation in China. Is, is that now reversing? Because certainly in the commodity markets and even in the gold market that's been more abundant for five or six years now, we're seeing what looks like inflation. Is this, is this where it's coming from, Dan? Yeah, there is a, I mean, the Chinese economy is quite strong. It's still roughly 6.7% you know, growth. Um, all the you know, rest of the world is also you know, putting in a lot of infrastructure projects. Uh, we're seeing now, yeah, copper's reaching new, you know, new recent highs. Uh, the global commodity market is definitely coming back. And as we all know, China's the main driver of that, buying over 50% of everything that's produced. Right. I mean, not only does China have 1.5 billion worth of U.S. treasuries that they could dump at a moment's notice. And as you point out now, America is only 15 to 20% of their export market. So they can now afford to dump those treasuries in a geopolitical financial war a currency war, and um, not only do they have this enormous uh, eco economic engine, but they control huge monopoly positions in strategic metals uh, and other um, elements that are used in things like uh, telephones and electronics, et cetera. They really are the swing player in the modern gadgets that run the world, yes? 
Yeah, absolutely. As you mentioned, uh, rare earths, you know, China is the dominant power. You go to Africa, it's, it's Chinese mining companies that are getting all the cobalt and everything else. You look at uh, Afghanistan, we go in and, and, and uh, you know, go to war with them, but then Chinese mining companies move in and extract the minerals. So these, these, these companies are very aggressive. They're all over the world, and uh, they are running the metals markets. You have the you know, Shanghai Futures Exchange now growing by leaps and bounds. China has now oil contracts traded in Shanghai. So, you know, between the, you know, the businesses and the, the infrastructure and the institutions that China's put it in, I mean, it's, 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 it's obvious that the Asian, so-called Asian, Asian century is happening a lot faster than we, we would expect. And the United States and China are going in completely opposite directions. Okay, Dan, got to cut it off there. Thanks. Hopefully you can stay around for another segment. Uh, that's it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. And uh, I'd like to thank our guest, Dan Collins of the ChinaMoneyReport.com. If you want to catch us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.